What kinds of scales are we talking about when we talk about photochemical and photophysical processes? Before we dive into this, I, I will caution you that we'll see a lot of numbers on the slides that follow, and memorizing the numbers is not really our goal. All our goal is is to get a sense of the relative orders of magnitude and, and really the relative, the, the word relative is key. What processes are generally faster than other processes and how much faster are they? You know, are we talking 10, 100, 1,000 times faster? What does that look like? And particularly when it, when it comes to time scales, you know, what are we looking at in terms of metric prefixes, right? Femtosecond, nanosecond, microsecond, millisecond can all be relevant to photochemistry. It's just what types of, of molecules, what types of processes are relevant on those time scales. So we're going to survey the most important length, time, and energy scales in photochemistry in this video just to get a general sense so that when we see a number like 10 nanoseconds, we have kind of a benchmark for what that means relative to other important time scales. For example, the length of time it takes for an electron to jump from the HOMO to the LUMO. How long does that take? We'll explore that in this video. How long does it take for a molecule to relax from a higher to a lower energy vibrational level? Again, something else we'll see in this video. Having a general sense of those time scales and energy scales is helpful to put photochemistry in context. So let's start with time scales. The table you see on this slide is a list of dynamic events with the fastest events at the top and the slowest events at the bottom. And these are all, in, in absolute human terms, very rapid processes, but on the molecular scale, they differ vastly in speed and in time scale. And so we're, we're interested both in the rate. And so this might be, for example, a, a unimolecular rate constant with units of inverse seconds or, or inverse time. And we're also interested in the length of time it takes basically for that process to run its course, which is a, a measure of the lifetime. We'll use the Greek letter tau to represent lifetime. And we'll dig into lifetime in more detail in a future video. But um, this gives you a sense of how long the process takes, quote unquote. The fastest processes really at the molecular scale involve electron motion, electron transfer, and the transfer of a proton. The movement of essentially subatomic particles at that stage, right? Very small, very light, very rapid to move. So for example, the absorption of a photon, which involves electron motion, is faster than almost any kind of chemical process we could conceive. And it's much, much faster than vibrational motion, which involves the movement of nuclei. And this distinction between electron movement and nuclear movement and their time scales and rates is key. It's key to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which we'll see in detail a little bit later. Weak bond cleavage is on the scale of picoseconds, so about a thousand times faster than electron and proton motions. We have simple bond cleavages of bonds that were weak to begin with, with very little or zero, in the case of an excited state, activation energy for that process to take place. Nanoseconds, you're talking about rotational and translational motion. The cleavage of relatively strong bonds and what we'll call spin-orbit coupling mechanisms that transfer electronic orbital motion to the inversion of an electron spin is what we're talking about with spin orbit coupling. That takes on the order of nanoseconds generally. No chemical reactions yet. These are all dynamics happening within a molecule. Photophysical processes so far if we're talking about an excited state. Ultra fast chemical reactions can happen on the microsecond scale where we're, we're talking about, for example, collisional uh, reactions, things like this. For an excited state, the rates can sometimes be even higher than this, but for ground state chemical reactions, 10 to the sixth is quite fast. Milliseconds, we're talking about in, in viscous environments or for very large molecules, things like, for example, proteins, rotational and translation, translational motions can be on the order of milliseconds. And then right around one per second, we're talking about fast chemical reactions. And so, so you know, so-called fast chemical reactions in the ground state are nowhere near, you know, 15 orders of magnitude slower than electron motion 
uh, involved in, for example, absorption of a photon. And so this is a, it's a general paradigm to keep in mind, right? Electron excitation is faster than vibrational excitation, it's faster than rotational excitation, and chemical reactions generally live, you know, somewhere in this nano to micro to millisecond ballpark, even for excited states. Now, what about energy scales? Well, you're probably familiar with the idea that light spans a massive energy scale, uh, depending on the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're living in. And you see that on the left-hand side of the slide here from ultraviolet all the way through radio waves. And check out the energy difference associated with these various types of light. We go all the way from 143 kilocalories per mole, which is enough to break a CH bond, quite strong in mineral, all the way down to radio waves, where we're at 2.9 times 10 to the negative sixth kilocalories per mole, which is barely enough to excite a nuclear spin transition for, for example, NMR. So massive range. There we're talking about, what, eight orders of magnitude from or, uh, ultraviolet to radio waves in, in kilocalories per mole. And keep in mind that the numbers are actually less important. So let's jump over the numbers and focus on the structures and motions involved in absorption or emission of that type of light. What type of transitions or what type of excitations can be promoted through the absorption of each type of light, each region of the electromagnetic spectrum? One of the key ideas of photochemistry is that ultraviolet and visible light are associated with the excitations of electrons and the promotion of orbital motions. This gets chemical reactions going. This gets molecules into an excited state where they can proceed to react in ways that are relatively predictable um, relative to, for example, the far ultraviolet and, and beyond. Infrared, though, doesn't quite get us there. We, we're not exciting electrons at that point, but we're exciting vibrations. So infrared, which is lower in energy, can get the nuclei moving. And there's actually a deep connection here to the time scales that we looked at on the last slide. Um, the fact that this is lower in energy and the time scales of vibrational motion are longer are absolutely related. When we talk about electron and nuclear spin, we're even at smaller energies. So microwaves are going to excite the spin precession of electrons and radio waves are going to excite the spin precession of nuclei. And you're familiar with this last point if you're familiar with nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, electron spin resonance or ESR or EPR um, is going to involve microwaves. And so for photochemistry, if we're talking about making chemical reactions happen, we're going to be living in the ultraviolet and visible regions of the spectrum in 99% of cases, I would say. One thing we haven't yet done with energy is appreciated how these energies of light, which we looked at on the last slide, relate to bond energies. You know, what wavelengths of light, for example, if we connect wavelength to energy, what wavelengths of light are associated with the bond energies of CC, CH, you know, carbon halogen, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon oxygen bonds, all of these common bonds in organic molecules have average bond energies. Where do those energies fall in the electromagnetic spectrum? And the answer generally is in the UV or for, in the case of weak bonds, the visible. If we look at the energies of excited states, we can also make similar connections. You know, where does the singlet energy, the energy, the S1 state of a ketone generally fall in relation to the electromagnetic spectrum? Well, based on this graphic, about 350 nanometers, right, is, is going to be enough to excite a ketone from its ground state to its S1 state. For anthracene, about, you know, 410 nanometers, say, is going to be enough to photo excite anthracene from its S0 to its S1 state. And one thing you'll, you'll notice from this diagram, which we'll return to later, is that the triplet states are always lower in energy. There's a good reason for this, which we'll explore later in the course. Um, but you can also get a sense of the gaps. They're anywhere from 30 kilocalories per mole, which is among the largest that we see here, to only 5 kilocalories per mole for the ketones. So the singlet triplet energy gap here, you can see, is much smaller in general than the singlet and triplet energies relative to zero. So in closing, I would just say here, the absolute numbers are not so important. What is important is making connections across graphics like this and across the tables that we saw previously and, and thinking in relative terms 
what processes are generally faster than others if we're talking about time. And if we're talking about energy and length scales associated with light and molecular states, you know, where does the visible spectrum fall in terms of energies? Not just in a number sense, but in terms of the types of functional groups, the types of molecules involved in their excited states and whether they're singlet or triplet. Getting an intuitive sense of these relative values is going to help you interpret photochemical results um, quickly and, and give you a, a good sense of where a result lies in the grand scheme of things, which is an intuition developed over time, but one that you can start to develop now if, if you're interested in becoming an expert photochemist.